I believe you were worshiping the Lord this morning. There's a big difference between just singing and worshiping the Lord, isn't there? Sometimes we just sing the songs that we like, and, you know, if, our, if we have that bubbling personality, then, you know, we just love the, uh, the way the lilt of the song goes. But when you worship God, you're in another world. It's another world. That's what God is looking for in a people. Well, today, we're going to turn into the New Testament here. back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The very first verse in this chapter is going to take us into that other world. For it says here, we know that if our house of this tabernacle, that's the body that we have now, were dissolved that we have a building of God a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens well I hear a lot of people saying well I'm just waiting you know till I go to heaven and get my new body well I've got news for you today you can have it right today you can have it now if you want it because the, the scripture tells me here that this is what God has prepared for those that love him. That there is a body that you can have in this life here. And as a matter of fact, this is the one thing that is uppermost in my own mind. I want that body. I want to experience the totality of of a body which has not just been uh, put together, born um, in my mother's womb, but a body that has been prepared in the heavens and is absolutely eternal. That means that there is not a possibility of ever having a sickness, a disease, a pain, a suffer at all, and that there is no end. It is an eternal body that can live on as forever. Well, a lot of people, when they start to get, you know, over 50, and I'm just over 50 now, so when they get over 50, they start to think, well, you know, things are slowing down for me. And then when you get to my age, many people say, uh, you know, I can't play cricket anymore. I can't do this. I can't do that. And so what do they do? There was a program on uh, television some years ago, and I used to watch it. It just fascinated me. It was simply two old people in in a retirement village. They both were about between 80 and 90 years old, and uh, they would greet each other in the morning. They weren't married, but they would greet each other in the morning. How are you today? What are you doing today? Waiting for God. That was what they used to say just waiting for God to take them off the planet there was nothing more for them to live there was nothing to live for Uh, they couldn't enjoy themselves as they used to when they were younger and so on and so on but see there is a body that he tells us here that we can have which is eternal if we uh, we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle be dissolved. The word dissolve is a very interesting word uh, because people have often said to me, when you put, um, uh, say, when you put sugar in a cup of hot tea, does it melt or does it dissolve? It's just one of those little things, you know, they make fun of. Well, the fact is, 
that the word dissolve here doesn't mean what it means in the English language. It's just a translation of a Greek word, and they didn't know any other word to use, so the translators used the word dissolve. But there is something that's got to happen if you want to have your home, your house, your body from heaven. Something has to change. What is it? Well, it says here, if we know that if our earthly, earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have, not will get, we have a house. A building of God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. The word dissolve actually means to separate two things that have been joined together. You understand that? To separate two things that have somehow been joined together, but they must be separated before you can have your body from heaven. What are the two things? The two things are your body and your soul. See, we say, I am body, soul, and spirit. The body and the soul have been connected together. Now, the soul is not just the female uh, population of the world. It doesn't just refer simply to a woman. Because the truth is that since Adam was in the Garden of Eden, then and he related to the woman by saying, you are bone, uh, or I'm bone of your bones, and I'm flesh of your flesh. If that is true, then of course he has made all of mankind, because in him he was Christ, Adam was Christ. All of mankind have therefore become the female species on the earth. We are all the woman today. That's the living soul. You understand? It does not just refer to the woman. Now, it refers to everybody, male and female. So, the soul and the, sp uh, and the body. You see, the living soul is simply somebody who is... Uh, the carnal mind is functioning out of the carnal mind and that carnal mind is in control of your body. And if your carnal mind is in control of your body, you are mortal. This carnal mind has no ability to make you immortal at all. Now, when we come to then to the scriptures and so on, and... Um, uh, we go to church, then of course somebody will tell us that if we give our heart to Jesus, if we confess our sin, if we ask Christ to come into our life, that now we are uh, born of God and we're a child of God. Well, of course, that's what we all believe. I did. For the first 40 years of my life, that was part, was what I basically believed, although I began to change toward the end. But you see, you can do all of those things. You can give your heart to Jesus, whatever that happens to mean to you. We all, I think, interpret that according to what we consider it to be. And then we confess our sin and we ask Christ to come into our life. I mean, the fact that he was already there, we didn't know that, so we ignored that. We just thought Christ came into my life when I asked him, please, Lord, I want you to come and live in me. But see, that never was a reality for me. If somebody walked up to me and said, is Christ in you? I'd have said, what are you talking about? That was in those days. And yet I, I had asked Christ to come to live in me, you see, there was no reality attached to what I was saying or doing. And many, many Christians have grown up like that. That's, where, that's why 
Many times when they come and listen to what God is now saying, they're amazed. Why didn't I understand this before? Because you had your head full of other stuff that wasn't, it never came from God at all. You understand? And, and this is the problem. And so today, I am deeply concerned that there be a people on this earth who know the truth, and that truth will set you free. Amen. And I mean, when a person is free, they must be free indeed. Amen. That's absolutely. Be free. So that we not have to go back and, and reconfess our sin, or ask Jesus to come into our heart again, or whatever. We don't need to do all of those things. So, the, the, carnal man, the, the carnal mind controlling the man. This is the living soul. The soul is not a part of the spirit. That's what most people have said. Soul is not part of the spirit because the living soul is somebody who is living under the control of the carnal mind. Well, the carnal mind got us into trouble right from the beginning. Because what happened in the beginning? What happened in the beginning? Well, you see, in the Garden of Eden, that when that woman came on the scene, the first thing she did after she was brought into being by the Lord God, who obviously had formed a body for her, and she's introduced to Adam, the first thing she does is go off on her own. She does not talk to Adam. She has no fellowship with Adam. Why? Because they're a different pair. They're different people. Adam was created in Christ Jesus. But the woman wasn't. She wasn't created at all. She was simply formed. You understand? I'm not putting you women down because I'm going to tell you later on it's okay. But this is how it actually was. Her body was formed by the Lord God and then introduced to the man. Now the man, Adam, was actually still asleep. See, when that deep sleep was put upon him, that's Genesis 2 verse uh, 22, when he was put to sleep, he never woke up. He never woke up. He was asleep. And therefore, you see, what happened in the Garden of Eden was the result of the fact that he was still asleep. Every day, when the Lord God walked in the garden, that's, that was in the, in the area in which God had created for the man to live in. That is the presence of God. Every day when Adam woke up, he was in the presence of God. And when he heard the Lord God in the garden, he was out there like a shot and they would walk together for the rest of the day. You see? But when the woman came on the scene, and he heard the voice of the Lord the Lord in the garden, what did he do? He's now got the woman with him, and he's hiding behind the trees. Why didn't he come out to the, to the Lord? Why didn't he walk with God that day? Because something had happened. And a relationship had developed between he and the woman. And he became a living soul. Living soul, it was interesting because you see mankind ever since that time has been a living soul. A person who is under the control of the carnal mind. The Apostle Paul said the carnal mind is an enemy of God. So it can never help you to walk in the ways of God. The carnal mind will never help you. It's an enemy of God. 
And the carnal mind has no ability to know the things of God. If you want to know the things of God, you have to start to function out of the mind of the Christ. Now let's look at that just for a moment. This is Philippians chapter 2. Philippians. Chapter 2 and verse 5. And this is the Apostle Paul speaking to you. And he says, Let this mind be in you. Let this mind. He doesn't say, uh, Get this mind. Or, you know, ask God to give you the mind of Christ. No, he doesn't say that. He just says, Let this mind. What does that mean? That means his mind must have been in you all the time. The mind of Christ was in you all the time. Yes. Why? Because Christ was in you. Amen. You see, as I showed you, I think, yesterday, that Christ was in you and you were in Christ before you were even born on the earth. <laughs> so you see, if Christ is in you, then you had the mind of Christ all the time. Right up to this day, you had the mind of Christ, but have you been using it? Have you been living? Yes. See? Out of that mind. This is the important thing. And so, he says here, let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God. Oh, now wait a minute. There's a condition here. If you want to function out of the mind of Christ, you've got to be in the form of God. Well, what form does God have? God is spirit. Are you spirit today? Amen. 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 You sure? Yes. Okay. I've got to make sure because, you know, as a preacher I know, he says something, everybody goes, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> All right, you know that you are spirit. And that spirit is living in a body. Yeah. And that body is the body of Christ. Amen. Right, you got all that straight now. Okay. So, this mind of Christ, who being in the form of God, so it does apply to you, thought it not a thing to be grasped at, to be equal with God. How many of you people here today are equal with God? <coughs> Why didn't you put your hand up? You're not equal with God? Well then God doesn't dwell in you. I am. Are you hearing this? Does Christ dwell in you? Amen. And Jesus Christ said in John chapter 10 verse 30, I and my Father. How many of you people are equal with God? Come on, you haven't got hold of it yet, have you? You haven't got hold of it yet. You see, Christ, you said, dwells in you. Who is Christ? He's the Son of God. But he said, I and my Father are what? How many of you are equal with God? Wait, don't, put it up, don't put it up there just put it up about oh come on come on okay. you see the carnal mind is so powerful that many times see you can you can hear a preacher and you can hear somebody telling you the truth and that carnal mind will get in there and say yeah 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 but will not let you possibly to understand what you taught, what's been said to you. Yes. If uh, Christ dwells in you, you must be equal with God, because yes. Christ and God were one. Yes. So we're not we're not trying to take to ourselves something that really doesn't belong to us. 
You've got to be careful about that. But, you are equal with God. I didn't even hear anybody say amen. What is wrong? I am not just preaching a sermon to you today. I am sharing with you truth that will set you free. And you better show me that you're getting free or I'm going to quit. So, it says, Who being in the form of God thought it not a thing to be grasped at or something that doesn't belong to us. No, we don't think that at all. I think I am equal with God not because I am Des Walter, not because I'm a preacher, not because I know Christ. I am equal with God because I am the Christ. Lord, help us. Help us, Lord. I am the Christ. You are the Christ. He dwells in you. You are equal with God. You see, it is so important for us that we understand these things. So important. So it says here, but, here's the big but, he made himself of no reputation. So what does it mean? Well, you've all told me that you're equal with God. But that doesn't mean that we go out there now and tell everybody as we walk down, hey, I'm equal with God. (laughs) Jesus Christ didn't do that. But I want you to know the truth. But you do not go out there and tell all the crowd out there that you are equal with God because that's not going to help them and it's going to make you feel pretty silly. Because people just look at you and say, you're you're just a human being like me. You say, yep, that's probably true from the way you can see it. But you know something that they don't know. But Jesus Christ, he made himself of no reputation. He was just, he walked down the street. Listen, I do not believe that when Jesus walked down the street, everybody kind of gawked at him because... You know, he had this beautiful, big, long, curly hair, and he had this peaches and cream uh, complexion, and, you know, he had on this beautiful white suit and maybe even, you know, a kind of a, a light glowing around his head or something. I don't believe he was like that. I believe he walked down the street just like me, just like you, just like you. He just looked like an ordinary man. But he made himself of no reputation. He didn't try to make himself better than anybody else. Beloved, be careful. Be careful. Because many times we offend God in our relationship with other people. We look at people and we judge them. You might look at, uh, you know, some of these young ladies that are you know, I don't know whether they were just getting dressed and forgot to put the rest on or what it was, but you know, their dress is pretty terrible and and so on. And when we see them, we judge them. Oh, you know, it's like the, the man in the Bible who said, I thank God that I'm not like them. You see, we're not to judge other people. He made himself of no reputation. And when we're dealing with other people, you and I know something they don't know. And so I can bless people out there, even though I may know that they're not walking in God, but I can bless them. Why? Christ is in them. Christ is in them. The homosexual. I know churches that would not let a homosexual even inside the church. Lesbians, all of the other stuff that's going on in the world. I don't say that that's okay. I don't say that that's what God wants. But I'm telling you today that in those people, Christ already dwells. We've got to understand this. That will give us a different kind of relationship with the people in the world. So, if we could separate those two things 
the calm mind controlling the, the body. He said we would have our home from heaven. We would have our body which is eternal. But we have to separate the two. So now this morning you see how long it took before you really got hold of the fact that you're equal with God. You see? And I'm not sure you've really got it yet or whether you just, you know, the uh, exuberance of that moment. I want you to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you and God are one. Not two separate people. Not you trying to be like God. That's the worst thing you can do. It's the fake that has kept people away from God. You know that? I've talked to men and women outside there who have nothing to do with God. And they said, look at so-and-so, you know. Actually, he's a preacher down there, but, you know, he does the same things as some of these other men we know here. Oh, God, help us. Help us to have a testimony in this world whereby people know that Christ dwells in us. I want to tell you, it's a lonely walk. It's a lonely walk. Why? Because when you really walk in the truth and you walk knowing who you are, you're not going to have a whole heap of friends out there. I was at the wedding of uh, our granddaughter just recently and I was so lonely in the uh, when, when the wedding breakfast was on as they call it breakfast at dinner time but anyway yeah. so we were having this uh, great feast there oh maybe uh, more than a hundred people I think were there it was a big crowd but see the people that were there at that wedding many of them didn't know Christ at all and so of course I found it very you know difficult to engage a conversation I tried to just you know have an ordinary conversation with people but they kept asking me but what do you do you know I mean uh, you have a job no no I'm retired what, or what do you do? Do you sit out in the veranda and watch the grass grow? What, what do you do? Do you do anything? Oh, I do a bit of travelling. Oh, you travel, do you? What do you, what do you travel for? Oh, yeah. And of course, they keep, on, they keep on to try and drag out of you what you do. So when I say, well, to actually tell you the truth, I, uh, you know, I preach the gospel around the world. Oh, boom. And that's the end of that. They don't want to talk to you anymore. You see? So it's a lonely walk. But then did you know that Jesus Christ was a man of sorrows? He was acquainted with grief. And not only that, but he, he was uh, despised and rejected of men. He was a man of sorrows. Oh God. Help me. I'm not complaining, but I'm saying it can be a lonely walk. Of course, this is wonderful. When I'm with people like you here, I just feel like I'm at home. You know, I'm at home. Because you, we are brothers and sisters in the truest sense. Why? Because your father is my father. Isn't that wonderful? Your father is my father. We're one. One family. Amen. And see, I have the privilege of going into so many different countries, and in every country I meet my family. And it doesn't matter what color their face is, it doesn't matter what uh, language they speak, it doesn't matter whether their dress is different than mine, it doesn't matter. We're still one. One family. All right. So if we could separate those two, the carnal mind controlling the body. While the carnal mind controls the body, it is open to every disease, every sickness, all the problems in the world. 
But if we could install the mind of Christ. That's why the Apostle Paul said, let us. You know where he got it from? He got that from God. See, when God created the heavens and the earth, he said, as he looked around, he said, there's darkness on the face of the deep. Do you know what the face of the deep represents for us? It represents your consciousness. And what was on the, 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 the consciousness of man? Darkness. Well, you know, like me, you get into a really dark room, you can't see anything. See? So, what does God do? I mean, creator of the heaven and the earth. He says, let light be. Let light, light be. And light was. And the consciousness of man was opened up to the things of God. So that was just a picture. But God said, let us. In Genesis 1 verse 26, it says, let us make man. <laughs> Did you know that you had a part in it all? Because the us is all of us. All of those who were created in Christ Jesus. Let us give man a body. Give him a manifestation of this earth. And God said, what a wonderful idea. I will dwell in every man. In Genesis chapter 2, you read about the Lord God. See, in Genesis 1, it's always God. God did this, God did that. That's Elohim. But in Genesis 2, you have the Lord God. That's Jehovah Elohim. Amen. Jehovah is the man, part of God. Yeah, we we'll say part of God. Jehovah was the man that was created. Jehovah was the man God created. And Elohim simply says, now I've got my home to dwell in on the earth. You see? So you are Jehovah Elohim as well. You are the man with God dwelling in. That's what Jesus Christ was on the earth. He was a man. Jesus was a man, born of a woman exactly the same as you and me. But in that man was the Christ of God. And so everything he did, these hands were the hands of, the, of his father, or the, the hands of Christ, the feet, the mouth, the eyes, the ears, everything was tuned into God. The Christ dwelling within Although he's the son of God, he and his father are one. For he is the offspring of God. That's an interesting word, isn't it? We don't use it very much today in our world, but our children are really our offspring. <laughs> because they are the same as what we are. In other words, when we have our children... They are born of the seed of man. Yeah, they're born of the seed of man. But when God brings man to the earth, he's not brought, brought into being by the seed of a man, but by the seed of God. The seed of God. What is the seed of God? See, all of these things, these words, have got to mean something to us. Not just, you know, the seed of God. Oh, well, you know, seed, you can have a bag full of seed or, or wheat or corn or rice or whatever, and you think of it like that. But what is the seed of God? Because God has a seed. It's Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16. We'll tell you. Galatians 3 verse 16 it says that when God was speaking to Abraham he said 
so shall your seed be as the stars of heaven. And now in Galatians 3.16, he says, God was not speaking about seeds as of many, but only one seed. That's all. And that one seed is Christ. Well then, where are all of the stars of heaven? Where's the seed as the stars of heaven? Where are they if God only taught, was talking about one seed? Well, it's very simple. Because the one seed was Christ. Yes. And in Christ was all of humanity. Six and a half billion people live on this earth today and every one of them was in Christ in creation. To say nothing of the billions and billions of people from the time of Abraham right through to today, the billions of people that have been on this earth, they were all in Christ. That's why he said, count the stars, Abraham, and if you will birth the Christ, you will birth the millions and millions that he, that God brought into this world. You'll birth them. I want to tell you, you wonder why every, every, every knee on this earth has not bowed the knee to Jesus Christ. You know why? Because we have not yet birthed the Christ. I'm not going to talk about that today, but maybe before we finish we might share a little bit about that but you see if you actually birth the Christ within you not as a baby not as a physical uh, birthing but as a spiritual birthing remember we do not have to birth a body for the Christ we don't have to birth a body for him do we? Uh 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 do we have to birth a body for him? Why? Come on, why? Because your body is his body. Yeah. Your body is his body. Come on, see? I want you to get hold of this. You haven't got hold of it yet, otherwise you'd have just told me. You don't have to create a body for him because, hey, this is his body. That's his body. And all I have to do is birth the Christ for this body. To fill this body from my feet to the top of my head with the Christ. And then things are going to change. And things will be different. And that's what's going to change the world. And nothing else. Nothing else. I don't care how good a preacher you are. I don't care how much you know about the Bible. It will not be until we have actually birthed the Christ in each one of us. All right. So, let's go back now. We've gotten off the track here. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Let's go back to this one. Second Corinthians chapter 5. So now he says, We know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, that we have a building of God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. So that's what we need, isn't it? Because for your body to become the temple of God, You see, for Israel, they built the temple in Jerusalem. It was a building made with the hands of men. It must have been a very beautiful building. And uh, in my travels, I have seen some uh, beautiful buildings uh, as churches. You know, they must have spent millions of dollars on some of them. Millions of dollars. These churches, great big cathedrals they are. And 
You know, I can just imagine the Lord walking down the road and seeing that great big building and saying, Oh dear. You know, people think that I live in there, but I don't. I don't care whether you pay a hundred million for the building. You will not have God dwelling in it because he doesn't dwell in, in buildings made with hands. Okay. So now, what about your body? Well, if this body is a, still a mortal body, is he going to take full charge of that mortal body? I mean, is he going to work inside a mortal body that can get cancer, that can uh, have uh, all kinds of disease, that's going to be maybe in a wheelchair because uh, it's got some real problem in that body? Is he going to dwell in his fullness in those bodies? No, I don't think so. And in any case, if he dwells in our body now, and, and this is his temple, then what happens when we pass on? What happens when we die? He's fresh out of a temple. He's got to vacate the premises. He's got to return back to the Father. Because the body is not eternal. So these two verses go very much together. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1. We know that if this tabernacle that we presently dwell in this house could be separated from the carnal mind then we would have our body from heaven that's what we need that's what we need because when the body is from heaven I believe then Christ will fill his body and we will be able to birth that body without any problem at all in fact it's you know, we use the term birthing the Christ because we don't know in the English language any other word to use. But it's not strictly a birthing as we would understand it, you know, in the natural. So now we understand that if we could get out of the control of this carnal mind and take its control off our body, because See, the serpent represented the carnal mind. And that carnal mind has been deceived now by the serpent. And as a result, it's never going to really lead you on into Christ. As a matter of fact, the serpent mind, or the carnal mind, I think is really a part of the religious world in which we live. Because so many people today are religious, but not spiritual. You notice that there's a big difference. Religion is something that you learn. You learn in here. Knowledge. People have knowledge. You see, and the first knowledge they were told was that if you give your heart to Jesus and you confess your sin and believe he died for you, that now you'll be born again, you're a child of God, and you go to heaven when you die. Well, that's what most people have believed, and they've just sat back in their armchair and said, I'm going to heaven when I die, and that's that. And you see, that's religion. And I want to tell you that there are millions of people on this earth today that go to church every Sunday, but it's religion they've got and not Christ. You see? And that's why for you people, and I'm, I'm not uh, judging anybody, I'm not judging anybody, but I'm telling you that if you people would begin to walk in the reality of God and begin to understand it and talk about it and, and of course, share it and minister it with the people, then changes will take place but you will not do it just in one week it may take quite a while but that's okay, just keep on but um, you have to be prepared there's going to be some people that don't want what you've got 
they're too happy with just being a Christian. I gave my heart to Jesus. That's all they want. So, let's go a bit further now. I want to show you what is really involved here. Because it says in verse 2, In this body we groan. Um, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. Well, is that true? Do you earnestly desire to have this body from heaven? Yes. I mean, is this filling your whole mind and saying, God, if there's only one thing I wanted from you, it is my new body from heaven. That's what I want. Because so much hangs on that. You see, if you have that new body... There's going to be a change take place and you'll see a change in your life and your ministry and everything. And I want to tell you, Pope, you know, because I, I've been, you know, on both sides of this thing. Um, then I decided just to join one side in the end. <laughs> because I resigned from the ministry. And when I say the ministry, I mean the religious ministry of the world. Where people go to a college and they get a degree or they get a certificate or whatever it is and uh, then somebody says, gives you the authority uh, you're to be a pastor and now you can preach yes, but I don't have any certificate today at all I have absolutely nothing I stand naked before God and if he hasn't made me into what he wants me to be to share the word of God then of course that would be his problem but he has done for me what I've needed and it wasn't to send me to another college <laughs> I only had one go at that and I will never go back again to any college and that's why one of the issues in my life was changed or the, my life changed when the first time that I went to Indonesia because this is back in 1975 so it's a few years ago in 1975, I went back. I went to Indonesia to minister the first, the conference of the first charismatic conference they had in Indonesia, and there were people from all over Indonesia came to those big. They were big conferences, and I went with a Catholic priest and a Baptist minister, myself and my friend, and one other, another chap, and I. Uh, when, uh, when my friend invited me to come because he was the one arranging the meeting, uh, my wife said to me, you're not an international preacher. I said, I know that. You don't have to tell me. Well, then what do you think? You, you think you're going to go over there and, and preach? And I said, well, if that's what God wants me to do, yes, that's what I want. And she took a while to get a hold of that. Of course, she did. She understood in the end. But you see, it wasn't that conference that God had in mind when he sent me over there to preach. Because I'm telling you, that was... Uh, I'm not going to even tell, tell you all about that. That was, that was something else. But after that conference, I was taken to a school of the Spirit. Not a Bible school. Not a Bible college. A school of the Spirit. Run by a man from... United States and that man was a man like I had never met before and he is one of those men that God put in my way that I was able to meet him and from that time I travelled about 40 times to Indonesia and I travelled the whole of that country with that man it was an amazing ministry uh, that whole show there, they had miracles every day. I mean, it was amazing. Just simply amazing. They believed God. It was a school of the Spirit. The people, the, the students that came, were not just taught theology. They were taught Christ. And their, their course was not finished until the eldership of, of that uh, work uh, was satisfied that they could hear the voice of God, they had to be able to hear the voice of God, and function out of the Spirit. 
And when they could do that, then they were ready to go out and to become a vessel in the hand of the Lord. It was an amazing experience for me. Amazing. And I learned so much. So much. And that went on for a number of years until that man went back to the United States. And then it, was a, it wasn't a church group I was with. It was a, actually a kind of a, a mission, really. It was like a mission. And that's how it was registered. It had to be registered with the government. In, the, in Indonesia, every church has to be registered with the government. Everywhere. So you can't just go out and start a church over there. It's got to be under the umbrella of some church that's already registered so you become a part of it or whatever. So when he went back to the United States, that that school just went because the man that took over never had the vision that the man that started it had. Never had the vision. And it was so sad to me. I stopped going there because it hurt me so much to see. They turned it. The man that took over almost immediately went to the government to, to uh, register as a church. And when they did that, that was the end of it. It just became another church. Whereas as it was, they had meetings once. They, uh, there was a village on the side of a mountain, not too far from where the, the center was. And the Lord said to them, I want you to take, to, to the man in charge, I want you to take a group with you, about five, six people. And I want you to go up on the top of that mountain, not down to the village on the side, go up to the top of the mountain, and I want you to just pray. So they did, those five people. Now, they don't like cold weather, Indonesians, I can tell you. And it was cool up on the top of the mountain. But they went up there, and that, that's all they did was pray for two days, two nights. Two days and two nights. And then God told them to go back down now to the village. Because there have been missionaries there over several years, not one convert. The missionaries were all discouraged that had been there. And the presence being that there was missionaries there, they were discouraged as well. So the Lord said, now I want you to go down to the village. They went down to the village and began to worship God. That's all they did. They had an old battered guitar there, and they just stood there and they were just worshipping God. They just ignored the people. They just worshipped God in the center of the village. Well, of course, it wasn't long before there was a great crowd of people gathering around. Who's this? What are they doing? So they're standing there, and these, uh, this group is just worshipping God. When all of a sudden, there was two men carrying a stretcher, pushing through the crowd, right through, until they got right to where the, this, this group was and just laid the stretcher down. And the group just continued to worship God. Just continued to worship God. Never even stopped. No. The other two, the men abroad just walked back into the crowd. But at a certain point, somehow, the Lord spoke to one of them and said, go take that lady that was laying on the stretcher by the hand and raise her up. And that uh, person did, that man did, took her by the hand, raised her up in the name of the Lord. She was dead. They were actually on the way to the funeral to burn the body, which is what they did over there. And so this woman stood up, and what do you think? In no time she was joining this group here that were worshipping God. She's worshipping God. Nobody had to teach her anything. She's worshipping God. She's in the presence of God and God is in her. <laughs> and she's worshipping. And that whole crowd, that whole crowd came to know Christ that day. 
that village was transformed. That's what I'm trying to tell you, folks. When we do what God tells us to do, things are going to happen. But we can't just do it according to how we've always done the thing. And that changed me, of course. It changed me. I mean, I hadn't seen anything like that at that time because this was really the beginning of this new life that I was just walking into. I'm telling you, that's only, I could tell you story after story, the experiences, it was incredible. So, beloved, listen, today I want you to walk in the reality of Christ in you. That's what I want. So, listen, it says, For we that are on this, in this tabernacle, we do groan, wanting to be clothed upon with our house from heaven. Yes, Lord, that's what we want to be clothed upon with our house from heaven. And so it says in verse 6 now, and this is the one I want you to get your eyes on, verse 6, Therefore, we are always confident that knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. While we are at home In the body, we're absent from the Lord. Well, now, I conducted many, many funerals in my day, back in the years gone by. And this verse, we always use this verse in the funeral. In fact, I don't think I've been to a funeral where they never used this verse. Be at home, the body is to be absent from the Lord. So, dear Uncle Joe down there in in that coffin, dear Uncle Joe is now absent from the body, And he's present with the Lord. I don't think so. I don't think so. That's what we've all believed, isn't it? Now I'm going to tell you the truth. Are you ready? What does it mean to be absent from the body? It means that your consciousness has been transferred from the natural to the spiritual. It does not mean that you died and you got (laughs) ahead. That's not what it means. He that is uh, sorry at home in the body. While you're at home in the body that is you are Settled and happy and doing just wonderful in your mortal body, you are absent from the Lord. Why? Because your spirit, the Christ in you, is not part of your life. It's not part of your life. You understand? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> to be at home in the body means that you are settled. I'm a Christian. I'm born again of the Spirit of God. I'm Christ dwells in me. We were saying all of this because we have now been taught. Christ dwells in me. But you are still happy in your body. So you are happy in a body that is still subject to sickness, pain and suffering. You see? And if you are happy in in a body of sickness, pain and suffering, then you are absent from the Lord because God doesn't dwell in a body that's got cancer. Lord help us. You understand what I'm saying? So we've got to be absent from the body. That is, we've got to move our residence out of this mortal body into the Christ of our true identity who has his own body, which is from heaven. That's the one that he received in Genesis 1.26. 
let us make man. There was the man. That was Christ Jesus. And not only was it Christ Jesus, that was you and you and you and you. All of you, that's who it was. You were that one that was created in Christ Jesus. And if you're in the body, happy in the body, settled in the body, you're absent from the Lord. Oh Lord, help us. Help us. This is so important, isn't it? So important. Now, I'll just run a little, little bit more for you. We're going to go down in this chapter a bit further. Let's see. Let's go down to verse 18. Oh, verse 16. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. We don't know any man after the flesh anymore. Even though we had known Christ after the flesh, yet now we don't know him that way anymore. You see, this is our problem. We recognize that Jesus Christ was on this earth. What did he look? He looked like a man. And so we automatically think now that because Christ is in every man, that every man is Christ. Well, no, of course, every man is not Christ. Because Christ is not the the person of your true identity until you understand and know that that is so. And if you know that that is so, when the Christ comes to dwell in you, then you're going to have to expect that your body is going to respond accordingly. So I have had a life that has been relatively free from the sicknesses and so on that most people have had. And it has been a wonderful life. And I know that was God. I know that was not the fact that I've got the right diet or I eat the right things because traveling the world, I eat whatever the people eat that, you know, that I'm with. And in some cases... That's, that's a little difficult for me but I do it because I want people to know that I'm one with them so he says we know no man after the flesh anymore so even though we knew Christ walked as a man we don't know him as a man anymore we've got to get that out of our mind we do not know Christ as a man walking out there you have to know that Christ as the Christ from heaven now dwelling in you. You see? Now dwelling in you. But, beloved, understand that the body that Christ had out there when he was in Jerusalem, that body must have been a perfect body. I don't think he ever had a headache. I don't think he ever had any problems whatsoever. I don't think cancer could have touched his body. I don't think anything could have happened to him. I think that if he had remained on the earth, he could have lived forever. He'd have still been alive. You know that in in the United States, I was taken once to see the sequoia trees, which are massive trees growing in the United States, and and they're so big. I've never seen trees like it in my life before. And they were telling me some of these trees were actually growing when Jesus was walking on the earth that's a long time ago but the size of the trees I am told by the people that know about this stuff that trees are eternal in the sense that they would never die unless something external to them uh, begins to attack them like borers um, I don't know what else but borers I know they, they can kill a tree isn't that amazing that a tree would continue to grow and grow and grow and grow unless there's some external thing touches them that robs them of life so now 
Let's go down a bit further. Verse 18. And all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. What does the word reconcile mean? Because this is very important. It says, all things are of God, who has reconciled us to Jesus Christ. Well, because my ministry was registered with the Australian government, which I had to do years ago, I have to have the books um, concerning the income and outflow and so on of finance. I have to have that um, sent to the government every year. And a man comes and he reconciles the account. What does he do? He takes all of the money that has come into the account, tabulates it all up there, and there is his amount. Then he takes all the money that we have spent, and all the dockets and everything, he's got it all there, and he adds all that up, and he's got a figure down there. And then he has a look at what's in the bank. So he puts that down too. And he reconciles the account. What does he do? He makes it all agree. Every line has to agree on the bottom line of the reconciliation. They all have to agree. The amount of money coming into the bank, into the account, the amount of money going out of the account, you take that from there, and then at the end, the money in the bank agrees with the reconciliation. It's reconciled. What does it mean to have to be reconciled to God? It's the most amazing story. For what it really means is that Christ exchanges your life for his. And that's what he did at the cross. God was in Christ reconciling us unto God. And what did he say? I'll tell you what I'll do. I will go to the cross as you. And that's what he did. He went to the cross as you. And we died in him. That was our death. And we need to understand and recognize that. That was our death. We are not the same person as we used to be. But you see, here's the problem. If we go to preach, give your heart to Jesus, nothing changes in a person's life. I know because of myself. I did that when I was ten years of age. And I know, I'm honest with myself, I know that very little, if anything, changed in my life. Because I went through my teenage years with many of the issues, you know, that young people face, even though it was a different era to what we have today. I mean, we didn't have drugs like they've got today and we didn't have alcohol like we've got today. There was alcohol, but it was not consumed as it is today. And all of the other stuff that goes with it, nightclubs and everything. We didn't have all that stuff, so we... We were very, I don't know, very ordinary people, I suppose you would say. But you see, nothing changed in my life just because I gave my heart to Jesus. And I knew that there was something much, much more that God had to give me, but I didn't know what it was for a few years. But slowly and slowly, God began to teach me. He began to teach me. And it wasn't until I really understood what reconciliation was. To reconcile the books concerning me and God, Jesus Christ said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I will become you with all your failings, with all your problems, with all the issues of your life. I will become you and I will take that all into death. And on the third day, I will release you into the world as me. Did you hear that? 
Let me say it again. God said, I'm going to reconcile you to my heavenly Father. So I will become what you are. I will take upon me all of your failings, all of the things that you've done, and so on, sin, whatever you want to call it. I'll take that all upon myself, and I will take it into death. And on the cross, he said it is finished. He did what he said. And three days later, he released you as himself. Do you understand this? That's reconciliation. You've been reconciled to God. He paid for everything. He paid for your sin. He paid for your failings. He paid for everything. But beloved, on that third day, he released you as himself. As himself. That's the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's your reconciliation. It's not just that he died for your sin. It's not just that he paid the price of your sin and failure and all of that and kind of, you know, just scribbled it out in the book and said, yeah, well, that's all cancelled. Yeah, I'll just sign that there. That's all cancelled. No, no, no. He actually took that from us, the burden of our guilt before God, and took it to the cross, and there it was nailed to the cross. He died to get rid of it. But he was still the Christ. And on the third day, he came to life. The Father brought him back to life. And he walked out of that too. And you were in him. You were in him. Where's your sin? It's gone. There is not one thing that God holds against any of you here today. Not one thing. Why? Because somebody's already paid for it. It wasn't just a cancellation. God didn't just cancel your sin. Somebody paid for it. Jesus Christ took it upon himself. All of our failure. And after the third day, he set us free. And we walked out of there as the Christ of God. May God help you today to grasp these things and to know and understand what it really means to be reconciled to God. It's not just rubbing out something that doesn't work in the reconciliation that God still holds this against you. No, 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 no. God holds nothing against you today. I don't care whether you murdered or what your sin has been or what your failure has been or what your body's sicknesses have been. I don't care what it is, but it was all taken care of. And you were set free on the third day. Resurrection, beloved, is setting you free to be what he is. May God bless you today, encourage you, and help you. Amen.